Hello everyone and welcome to this quick fire revision for index 7. This is on cash flow statements. I would rate this chapter as important. Specifically, it needs a bit of practice. Currently, we are not doing sums over here. We are more discussing about the key principles that need to be remembered while preparing the cash flow statement. Now, cash flow statement is one of the core financial statements. It is not something like a related party report or a segment report which is in the notes to accounts. It is a part of the core financial statements and it has to be prepared on the standalone as well as on a consolidated basis as a separate financial statement. Now, what is a cash flow statement? It is nothing but in a way a vertical summarized and a clean classified version of the cash and bank account. So, when we are preparing the cash flow statement during the year, there have been movements of cash. We might have paid cash, we might have received cash and as a result, the opening and the closing bank balance is different. Now, we want to trace the sources of this difference and hence we segregate the cash flows into three main categories. We call them as cash flow from operating activities, cash flow from investing activities and cash flow from financing activities. So what goes into operating activities, those items which are which are paid or which are received in the ordinary course of business like money collected from debtors, money paid to creditors, salaries and wages, wages paid, uh, advertisement expenses paid, all of these arise out of your day-to-day -day course of operations and hence these are cash flow arising from operating activities. Second is a cash flow which is arising, let us I'll just go, uh, come uh, first over the cash flow arising from investing activities. These are cash flows which are arising due to acquisition or disposals of certain non-current assets like PP, intangibles or long-term investments. In which case you will recognize the cash flows on the purchase of these assets as cash outflows from investing activities or cash flows from selling those assets as cash inflows from these investing activities. Apart from these, certain investments also fetch you interest or dividend and if interest or dividend is received on these investments, they will also go under investing activities. In fact, if there is any tax paid, tax paid on these incomes, let us say capital gains for example or interest income for example will go in the cash flow from investing. Usual business related tax arising from sales and purchase and regular business expenses goes under the cash flow from operations. However, tax arising specifically from investing activities will go under cash flow from investing. And the third is cash flow from financing which is cash flows from the providers of capital. This can be equity shares, this can be preference shares, this can be loans, debentures, borrowings etc. So, cash flows arising from taking these loans, debentures, share issues will be considered as well as cash flows on repayment or redemption or a buyback of these instruments will also go under cash flow from financing. Additionally, if there's any interest paid or dividend paid, that will also go under cash flow from financing. Now, these are the three main categories of cash flows. Ultimately, if I take the total of these three items, I will get the net changes of cash and cash equivalents during the year. To that, you add the opening cash and cash equivalent in order to get the closing cash and cash equivalent. Now, before we proceed, we need to figure out what is cash, what is cash equivalent. Cash usually arises from the legal tender like rupees, dollars, etc. They are all cash. Whereas a cash equivalent is something which is a short term marketable security. So, cash equivalent means a short term marketable, highly liquid security with, uh, uh, with a fairly stable value. So, a determinable value. So, when we are looking at, let us say, a two month or a three month treasury bill, this is highly liquid, it is very short term that is it is less than 3 months from the date of acquisition and it gives you a determinable value. On the other hand, if I were to invest in equity shares of a company, it can be liquid probably. However, it does not result into a determinable amount of money and hence investment in equity shares are not treated as cash equivalents but investment in short term, very short term government bonds with a tenure of less than 3 months. Remember from the date of the acquisition, not just from the balance sheet date, from the date of acquisition can be treated as cash equivalents. Apart from that, there may be certain instruments which are open ended that is they don't have a stated maturity date in which case they can be treated as cash equivalents if your intention is to redeem those instruments within a period of less than 3 months and these instruments give you a fairly stable value, then it, it can be treated as a cash equivalent. You can have investment in bonds which are for a period of greater than 3 months. Let's say 5 months, 6 months, 1 year, 2 years, these will be financial assets, investments, they will not be a part of cash equivalent for something to be called as a cash equivalent including bank fixed deposits. It has to have a tenure of less than 3 months from the date of its acquisition. A very uh, contentious point over here is the determination of the classification for bank overdraft. In the balance sheet, a bank overdraft is always shown as a part of short term borrowings 
in your current liabilities. However, under the cash flow statement, the classification of bank overdraft depends on the nature of the bank overdraft, on why the bank overdraft was taken. If the bank overdraft is permanent in nature, that is consistently throughout the year, you see a negative or an overdrawn balance, in which case it must have been used for financing certain assets and hence overdraft is in such cases treated as permanent in nature, in which case it is a financing activity. Overdraft should be taken into cash flow from financing. However, if the overdraft is temporary in nature, which means in some of the months positive, some of the months negative, positive, negative, and hence it is temporary, in which case it is a part of the cash management activities. Like in your CA inter, you prepared cash budgets when you did your inter CA FM. It is a part of your cash management activities, positive, negative, positive, negative, in which case we say that, well, we are not using overdraft as a source of finance. However, in bad uh, or in slack times, in case we have to make certain payments, to avoid the payment bouncing, we are just taking the overdraft facility and as a result, it is not like a financing item, but it's a part of the cash equivalents. So in the cash flow statement, in such cases, overdraft can be shown along with cash and cash equivalents. In the exam, if nothing is going, you can write a note and assume the overdraft to be a part of cash and cash equivalents and hence you'll have the cash balance plus let us say the current or saving bank balance minus the bank overdraft to give you the cash and cash equivalents to start with. If the question remains silent, you'll have to write a note to assume. Having said that, irrespective of what you assume for the cash flow statement in the balance sheet, the bank overdraft will always be shown as a part of liabilities and will not be netted, or netted out from the cash and cash equivalent balance. Okay. In certain cases, you might be holding foreign currency cash. Now, usually when you are showing the cash flows, you are showing the actual movements of cash. However, if I have $1,000 at the start of the year and if I have done nothing during the year, at the end of the year, I still have $1,000. So technically, my cash flow will be zero. However, these thousand dollars at the start of the year may be worth 70 per dollar. At the end of the year, they may be worth 80 per dollar. Now, these same thousand dollars are there with me. However, these thousand dollars in rupees are now worth more. And hence, that, that foreign exchange gain will be shown as a part of reconciliation. So you'll have net changes in cash and cash equivalents plus opening cash and cash equivalent plus the foreign exchange gain on the cash will give you the closing cash and cash equivalent in case there is a foreign exchange gain on cash and cash equivalent balance. Remember the other foreign exchange gains like debtors, credit, etc. etc. or loans may be adjusted along with the cash flow statement, but the cash the foreign exchange gain on the cash and cash equivalent balance will be shown as a part of a reconciliation separately. Okay. So over here, uh, we have discussed about classification of cash flows, etc. There is there are two methods of presenting cash flow statement, especially cash flow from operations. There is something called as a direct method where you take the cash collection from debtors minus a cash payment to creditors minus a cash payment for expenses and taxes paid in order to find the cash flow from operations. Here, this method can be used if a bank account is directly given to you, in which case indirect method is not possible or in case a balance sheet along with the profit and loss is given to you. So we can take the sales adjust the opening and the closing data. So you prepare a debtor account, opening debtors plus credit sales minus the closing debtors will give you the cash collection. For cash payment to creditors, if in the PL COGS is given, we can use the COGS to kind of back calculate the credit purchases. So COGS is opening credit, uh, uh, opening stock plus credit purchase minus closing stock, assuming all sales, all purchases are on credit, in which case you will find the credit purchases. Use those credit purchases in the creditor account, opening creditors, plus credit purchases, less closing creditors will give you the amount of payment. Similar is the case with expenses where you will adjust the expenses payable or prepaid expenses account to find the expenses paid and hence you get the cash flow from operations using the direct method. Direct method can be applied in case your bank account is given or in case balance sheet and profit and loss both are given. However, in certain cases, you might need to prepare the cash flow statement using the indirect method. Remember, the difference in direct and indirect method arises only in the cash flow from operations. Investing and financing remains exactly the same. So when we look at the indirect method, you can prepare the indirect method in case the data of two balance sheets are available. You may or may not be given the PL account, but even if you are given data of the two balance sheets along with a few adjustments, you can use the indirect method. Now, indirect method implicitly assumes over here, if I look at indirect method, let us say, in indirect method implicitly assumes that the net profit is a cash flow. Why should it be different? Net profit should be the cash flow from operations. However, there are some impurities in the net profit. Notably, there are certain non-cash items like depreciation, amortizations, write-offs. So if you add back these non-cash expenses, you should ideally get the cash flow. However, we are not just interested in finding cash. We want to find the cash flow from operations. So you add back non-cash items to find the cash flow. However, 
this net profit must be calculated after considering interest income after considering interest expense exp interest expense is financing in nature interest income is investing in nature profit or loss on sale of fixed assets which is investing in nature etc and hence you need to find the cash flow from operations and hence you will reverse these effects like interest income must be a part of the net profit will be reduced to find cash flow from operations mind you the interest income will be shown as a cash flow from investing similarly interest expense which must have been reduced while calculating net profit must be added back in order to uh, find the cash flow from operations mind you separately will still show the interest expense in the cash flow from financing so basically from the net profit you will make the non-cash adjustment and then you will make the non-operating adjustment so expenses will be added back incomes will be subtracted now this should ideally give you the cash flow however you have just focused on the non-cash or the non-operating items within operating items as well like sales like purchases like salaries it is possible that the sales that is written in the income statement is not necessary the cash that is collected from the debtors like for example the sales is thousand however the opening debtors are hundred the closing debtors are 200 which means during the year you actually go to see you have not collected thousand you must have collected let us say if you prepare the debtor account you must have collected 900 rupees that is why the debtors are increasing by 100 which means if it is if that if the debtors are going from 100 to let us say 200 that means your cash collection is lower to the extent of 100 or if there are creditors creditors where your opening creditors are 100 closing are 200 in which case if your credit purchases which is let us say for simplicity same as a cogs if that is 500 you are assuming 500 must have been paid but that is not the case because if your opening creditors are 100 and closing are 200 which means you have paid 100 less if you open the credit or if you prepare the creditors account you will see that the payment is actually 400 and hence you will have to make these operating assets or liabilities or simplistically called the working capital adjustment now in working capital adjustment the general rule is if there's an increase in current assets you subtract if there's a decrease in current assets you add that is current assets have an inverse relationship the logic over here is if the current assets for example like debtors are increasing that means you are collecting lesser cash and hence you subtract on the other hand if debtors are decreasing that means you are collecting more cash and hence you add on the other hand current liabilities are supposed to have a direct relationship like if creditors or outstanding expenses are increasing that means you are paying lesser cash and hence your cash balances will be more whereas if the creditors or outstanding balances are relatively decreasing in which case you, are, you have paid more cash during the period and hence you will ideally subtract so over here long story short you will make three adjustments you will start with the net profit if there's tax you'll add back tax to find the profit before tax then you will take all the workings non-cash adjustments non-operating adjustments and working capital adjustments that will give you the cash flows before tax whatever is the tax paid you will subtract while doing these working capital or operating assets or liabilities adjustments you should focus primarily on the current assets which are linked to operations current liabilities which are linked to operations even non-current assets or non-current liabilities which may be linked to operations like for example your current liability may include a proposed dividend however proposed dividend is linked to financing and hence will not be a part of this adjustment it does not impact the net profit in a similar way your non-current asset or non-current liability may include a liability like gratuity for example and gratuity is operating in nature will affect the cash flow from operations so in certain questions the institute has considered the non uh, the uh, in the operating assets and liabilities they have also considered other non-current assets other non-current liabilities notably there's a study material question on Kubert limited where they've taken this because it is specifically given in that question that other non-current assets and other non-current liabilities pertain to operating items and hence you will even take that into your uh, operating assets and liabilities adjustment another example of a non-cash item can be in case of consolidated financial statements there can be let's say share of profit from an associate remember if there's a share of profit from an associate that is a non-cash adjustment and in case of a cash flow statement if there's a profit you will subtract because it has not been collected in cash by the group for the same similarly there can be impairments or write-offs which are also non-cash in nature for which you might need to make certain adjustments so over here uh, you can just remember this general rule for the purpose of cash flow under the indirect method then there is the entire format that we have, that we have considered for illustrative items which can go in the cash flow statement usually when you prepare the statement in the vertical form if there's a cash inflow you show it as a positive number but if it's a cash inflow you show a uh, cash outflow you show it in brackets for a better presentation and calculation so uh, this should kind of uh, take care of the broad uh, cash flow from adjust cash flow items a couple of special adjustments which the institute also sometimes takes is in case there is an acquisition in case there is an acquisition how the institute accounts for this is 
it will show let us say if i've paid 74000 to acquire a business that 74000 is shown directly as cash flow from investing however the business that i acquire has a 2000 rupee cash so i say okay i'm paying 74000 but in return i'm getting a business which has a 2000 cash and hence 74 minus 2 that is 72000 might be shown as a cash flow from investing outflow at the same time there may be various assets which are required including current and non-current assets in which case you will adjust either the opening or the closing balances to find the true cash flow like for example if you had fixed assets worth 100 at the beginning and they become 150 at the end now during the year there is an acquisition of which has happened for which 30 are the fixed assets taken over so you can either adjust the opening balances and say okay opening mein 100 the plus another 30 due to acquisition for which we have kind of already considered the 72,000 payment minus 150 and hence 20 must be the additional purchases during the year same is the case with let us say inventories debtors and every other item you can either adjust the opening add to the opening or you can adjust the closing where you subtract from the closing in order to make a prudent comparison also another adjustment that can be considered in case of consolidated statements is once you acquire control at the time of acquisition of control the payment of consideration is taken as cash flow from investing however once control is acquired let's say you have a 70 percent stake and then you acquire another 10 percent stake you don't acquire any assets or liabilities in the consolidated accounts however that is shown as a purchase of nci transaction and if it is a purchase of nci transaction it will be treated more so as a buyback and in case of let us say a I mean not a buyback but in case of NCI, NCI is shown as a provider of capital and hence you can treat this as a financing transaction, a purchase of NCI transaction can be treated as a financing, a cash flow from financing activity. In certain cases like zero coupon bonds for example, index 109 tells you to recognize on an effective interest method, however effective interest is not a cash flow. So when you purchase a zero coupon bond, you can show it as a cash flow from investing and then in each of the years when effective interest is recorded, that's a non-cash item, it will not even be shown as a cash flow from investing, however in the year when the bond is redeemed, there will be a cash inflow, you can segregate this into interest and principal components, having said that, you can show this as a cash flow from investing totally in the year of redemption. So this is just giving you a broad overview of the chapter on cash flows. I hope this revision video has been helpful. You need to practice questions on cash flow. It is not something that uh, you can directly solve just listening to this small lecture. It is just going to polish what you have or revise what you have already done. Just uh, try to uh, revise uh, cash flow. Do a couple of sums, numericals on pen and paper and you should be good to go. That should be it then. I'll see you in the next session with some other video. Till then, study hard, study well and goodbye.